So people will get started. After this class, I have to go for a CT scan. So we'll just get started without much ado. Yeah, uh, I was doing this whole thing of what has been called I Okay, so I told you that from the late uh, uh, mid 1980s actually down to the uh, down till today, we can basically talk about one kind of uh, one kind of uh, liberalism that has taken place, uh, that taken, uh, uh, not place, I'm sorry, taken its uh, roots uh, in um, uh, what was the erstwhile uh, USSR and uh, uh, then the Southeast Asian countries and China and India. I was trying to tell you that uh, somebody like uh, Noam Chomsky says that uh, Russia actually, or uh, the USSR, uh, had uh, propped itself on the basis of an arms race 
with the USA, uh, arms race and the space race. Uh, in fact, uh, their final uh, attempt to equal the Americans uh, was the creation of a space shuttle, uh, which they called the Buran, B-U-R-A-N. So the, this is not something too many people in this generation know. Uh, the Russians, uh, the Soviets did have a space shuttle called Buran. Uh, and um, uh, what we also know is that they had constructed this uh, international space station, the ISS, which is, by the way, still functional and uh, keeps hosting astronauts and cosmonauts. Now, let me, since I'm using those two terms, uh, let me kind of uh, um, tell you what is the difference of the usage. They don't mean two different things. Uh, the Americans uh, actually like to call uh, the outer space as that which is uh, uh, astral, A-S-T-R-A-L, uh, and uh, they call the planets and the other uh, galaxies and solar systems, they call all of them um, astral bodies. So sending people into space was the equivalent of uh, uh, for them sending people into towards the astral uh, bodies and into and since they did go to the moon uh, and they basically therefore called it uh, they called their uh, personnel who went into space they called them astronauts and uh, the Russians to be different from the Americans. They took the conception of space as a cosmos. And so they called their uh, personnel who went into outer space, uh, they called them um, cosmonauts. So otherwise, there's no difference. It's just that uh, each country was trying to make a, a different kind of an argument, give a different kind of name to themselves. Uh, so we, I don't know if you are aware of this, uh, uh, we managed to send uh, a cosmonaut, because those were the days uh, when we had friendly ties with the uh, with the uh, Soviets. So uh, we sent two people into. Uh, sorry, we trained two people to go into space. Uh, their names were Rakesh Sharma and uh, Ravish Malhotra. Uh, both of them were from the Air Force. And uh, uh, Rakesh Sharma is, for your information, a uh, Hyderabadi. Uh, he was a product of... Uh, St. George's Grammar School and that of uh, Nizam College. Um, and he was, later uh, he moved into the Indian Air Force. So they 
choose i think by lottery who would go into space and it was uh, uh, rakesh sharma whose name came up so he was uh, at that time i was a student in uh, nizam college and uh, uh, we were uh, all thrilled and overjoyed that a nizamian was going into space like i keep telling you the nizam college of today is nothing it's a it's, it's what is left of uh, once great institution it is now rubble and dirt that's what it is today uh, anyway but that's a different story uh, so we wanted to celebrate and one of our teachers somehow managed to get him to come to the college and uh, we all went and met him and spoke to him and all that kind of stuff so anyway but that's uh, uh, he went in a soyuz capsule to the he went to the international space station and uh, in those days it was uh, mrs indira gandhi who was the prime minister of the country and i still remember there was a chat with him which was shown on television uh, she was of course in the isro tracking station at uh, hassan in uh, karnataka and he was up there in space and she asked him uh how does india look from there can you make out india she said and he said yes and she said how does it look and he said sare jahan se acha so i can't forget those words uh so we grew on that kind of patriotism and uh, and he didn't say it just for the sake of saying it he meant it uh sir what is the difference between moon and space no moon is just a body in space see i told you there are uh, two kinds of uh, uh understanding of space one understanding of space is absolute which is that there is a thing called space in which you have various different uh planets moons are technically uh satellites which means while the main planet goes around the sun the moons go around the planet so the moon the technical term for that is satellite okay and there's no just one moon we have just one moon uh but a uh, planet like jupiter i think has four or five moons and uranus also has multiple moons so a moon is a satellite and it's one of the uh, astral bodies one of the bodies in space so that is one kind of understanding of space that it is ab- absolute and uh, which is when and you don't know then what the limits of space are we have absolutely no understanding of uh, where all does this space go and i told you there is a uh, very big problem and that particular problem is if you say space has an end then you'll say what is after that and if you say space doesn't have an end then it is infinite and how much how much is infinity so we don't know that is one uh, idea of uh, space which is the absolute idea the uh, other uh, idea that we have 
of uh, space is that it is relative. Relative in the sense that it is the distance, the open space between two astral bodies. Okay, it's like uh, saying that in a room, uh, if you build a room, uh, the space in that room would be the openness uh, that exists between the ceiling and the roof and uh, what am I saying, the ceiling and the floor and uh, the walls. So they uh, form an enclosure and what is in between, which is empty, is called space. So we say there is no more space to put anything else here. So that is the relativist uh, conception of space. It works for rooms and uh, other things, but it is not such a wonderful way of uh, trying to understand the universe as a distance between um, uh, different uh, bodies, uh, which are astral. So the moon is just an object in space, if you want to know that. Technically, it's a satellite. The moon is not like the earth, meaning the earth is actually a designation given to a particular planet. But if you look at the moon, the moon is not a designation given to this particular celestial body that goes around our earth. It is not that. Moons are every, every uh, or most, uh, most uh, of these have uh, most of these have most uh, planets in our own planetary system have uh, many different moons. It's like the sun. Uh, what we actually call uh, uh, the sun is that the sun is also a star. Uh, due to the distance in between the sun and the earth in the galaxy, which is called the Milky Way, the sun is called the sun. But in the night skies, if you see from a place where there's no pollution, they're all the stars that we call them are uh, nothing but suns. They're all burning uh, objects of hydrogen. And the reason why you get that twinkling effect is because they are billions of light years away. Uh, and I don't want to tell you the calculation of what exactly a light year is. Uh, so billions of light years away, which essentially means that uh, what when you look up at the stars in the sky, you're not seeing the image. Uh, you're not seeing the image that has been formed. I mean, you're not seeing that object as it is. Okay, when you're looking at the moon, the moon, right, that is how it is today. So when you look at the, the stars, since the light takes, the light from those stars takes so many years to come uh, down to the earth, you are uh, actually looking at something from probably before your, uh, what should I put it? It's probably something that is coming from the 18th century or 19th century. That is how much it takes the time. 
So you're seeing that and uh, it's quite possible that those stars, some of them are no longer there. Okay, it's quite possible that they are no longer there. So that is how you look at space. But why are we talking about space? Let's get back to liberalism. And uh, when we look at this the whole idea of uh, rebooting of laissez-faire uh, capitalism, uh, please understand that uh, laissez-faire is that what John Locke talked about, which is no interference or minimal interference. And uh, therefore, uh, what we do see is uh, what we do see is a uh, an economy that uh, is supposed to take care of itself. Uh, this happened uh, mainly first in the case of the European countries, but uh, capitalism. <laughs> One second, please. Maya, would you be kind enough to take these dogs out? And get me some water, please. So, man, I need some water, please. I'm really sorry uh, about these disturbances. Um, I'm supposed to be in isolation. Only the dogs have been company to me, but these have become terrible things as they have grown. They hear the slightest noise, they just bark, which is very bad and embarrassing. Anyway, so capitalism gained a fresh lease of life. Uh, and fan. Uh, uh, it gained a fresh lease of life because of the sudden opening up of so many economies. So within the rebooting, if you have Thatcherism and uh, Reaganomics as one side of uh, the rebooting of laissez-faire, uh, you have the uh, another side to this rebooting, which actually comes a little later in uh, terms of the um, what should I say, uh, in terms of uh, time, it happens a little later with the disappearance of the USSR in the Eastern Bloc and the countries that relied upon them. And we are talking mainly about uh, a number of countries like uh, India, uh, to a certain extent, China, and uh, uh, and of course, uh, because of the Western capitalism also going through a problem, there was a problem in Southeast Asian countries, which were not tied to the USSR and the Eastern Bloc. Uh, these countries, namely uh, Korea uh, and uh, then uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, but Vietnam and Laos are those countries that are again tied to the collapse of the USSR. So, so you see so many economies which were uh, artificially being propped up, so to speak. And I gave you the reasons. I told you that Mrs. Gandhi uh, made the fundamental 
Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that is, she uh, made the fundamental error of a tampering with the structure of uh, industrial growth uh, that her father as the prime minister had laid down, which was, you know, all the uh, infrastructure uh, related industries uh, being taken care of by the state and uh, leaving the non-infrastructural industries, which were basically called cosmetic industries, uh, those were left to private players. And uh, what we had in India was, at that time, a system called the License Raj. Uh, the License Raj is a, a take on British Raj which was what colonialism was. And uh, when people spoke about uh, License Raj, what they meant is if you had to do anything in India, you required a license for it. And uh, that basically meant uh, that you had to apply to, you know how the bureaucracy is. At some point, uh, all of you must have been uh, kicked around from one place to another uh, just to do a job which probably would have otherwise taken two or three minutes. Um, so the problem with the bureaucracy in India, uh, you must understand, uh, is that uh, uh, I would like to do a little bit of public policy with your people. It's not a compulsory paper for you. And it's not likely to be offered as an optional. And even if it is, you won't uh, get the correct information. Uh, the bureaucracy in India was actually created to serve the British. When they were here, they made it. So it was never meant to serve the local people, unlike the bureaucracies in Western countries, which were created to serve the people, the interests of the people. Uh, so what happened here in India is the bureaucracies uh, basically continued with the spirit in which they were created, which is to learn uh, to be of service to the powerful people. And uh, so uh, once the British left, then it was up to the Indians, um, especially the upper class, upper caste Indians, to take over the bureaucracy. And they continued to behave like the British bureaucrats. They continued to behave like the British bureaucrats. Uh, they were treated as kings, even today. Why is there this great rush in UPSC in all the non-developed states of India? Okay, you will not find developed states of India pursuing people from developed states of India uh, pursuing this uh, UPSC goal, dream. Maharashtra hardly sends anyone. Tamil Nadu doesn't send anyone. Kerala doesn't send anyone. Uh, Karnataka doesn't send anyone. Uh, so in the south, it's primarily Telangana. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, <clears throat> sorry, to a certain extent, uh, Andhra Pradesh which is now developing much faster than Telangana. And uh, you will see that uh, it is from here that there is this rush to become an IAS officer or whatever. Uh, and uh, the entire northern country, not northern part of the country, sorry, which doesn't have any kind of 
uh, an industrial infrastructure does not have any kind of uh, a service industry nothing if you uh, actually it hurts me to say this uh, but uh, if you go into the interior of the north uh, i have been there and uh, if you see the interiors of the south the interior areas you could think that you are in two different countries you get a service industry by that i don't mean the call centers and all that you get a service industry in small towns okay in uh, the south including these uh, andhra pradesh not telangana telangana no in andhra pradesh there is a very strong service industry to take care of uh, marriages funerals and those kind of things there is a pretty developed service industry there and uh, that is because of the fact that they were a part of the british presidency which was capitalist so they saw greater development whereas telangana is still very backward and uh, in terms of the service industry so there's no service industry and uh, so that is one you you might think that these are two different countries you probably won't get to feel that this is one country and it it's not a good thing to say uh, doesn't make me feel good at all saying these things but that is how it is that is the truth of the matter so a little bit of public policy would help uh, and uh, so to come back therefore the southeast asian countries were the first that uh, uh, that already were looking at a certain kind of capitalist growth thanks to their being a part of japanese colonialism i told you that there is a one second please there is a fundamental difference there is a very very um, uh, big uh, difference uh, between the southeast asian countries that were under japanese colonialism because japanese colonialism developed the infrastructure in those countries where it colonized so the entire southeast asia and like i told you the other day uh, shanghai guangzhou and there's another province How, however much hard i try i am unable to recollect the name of that place there are three of these sing the answer sorry sing the answer Xinjiang, not really. Yeah, but it, that too is a part of Japanese colonialism. Uh, it is a part of Japanese colonialism, but uh, it's not so developed as uh, Shanghai and Guangzhou. And because Beijing is their uh, capital, that is developed. The rest of the Soviet, uh, the China, we don't know because they are. Uh, they are now the iron curtain country a uh, name that was given once to the eastern bloc and the soviet union because you they didn't let anyone see what was happening in their countries so anyway so these countries already had capitalism the ones that had been uh, colon uh, colonized by uh, the japanese uh, and uh, therefore they were the first target of the rebooted uh, bretton wood institution woods institutions the imf and the world bank and uh, in the 1990s the southeast asian countries minus uh, vietnam and laos 
came to be called the tiger economies. It was especially Korea was one of the tiger economies. Uh, then there was Indonesia and Thailand. And uh, so you see that um, it is a very, very uh, important thing that happened in the 1990s because these once uh, uh, liberalization happened uh, in these economies uh, for a second time, then um, they started developing very fast uh, and the fact that the 1990s also forced the other economies uh, which were once either uh, uh, a part of the Eastern Bloc or were relying on the Eastern Bloc like India. Uh, these countries also had to open up their markets. Uh, now, a number of people will tell you that uh, we are, uh, we were uh, following neoliberal economics uh, or classical laissez-faire capitalism, whatever you want to call it, call it. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is that it was circumstances that forced us to do that. We didn't have a choice. So any other, uh, any criticism of what happened in that particular period was completely, completely invalid that, you know, this brought in uh, market uh, uh, economy into place and all that. I remember I was attending a seminar in which there was this man from Kerala who claimed that he was a Lohiaite uh, follower of Ram Manohar Lohia, who was a Marxist of sorts. Uh, and they claim that all this is rubbish, this uh, whole thing that is being done in the name of reform is nothing but, you know, succumbing to capitalism. Uh, such criticism is completely invalid because what uh, option did we have? We had a country that was left with two weeks of foreign reserves. Two weeks of foreign reserves was all that we had. Uh, and we were on the verge of bankruptcy. So we had to go in to this particular thing, which is uh, called WB is World Bank, IMF is International Monetary Fund, and both of these are Bretton uh, Woods institutions. I feel very sad, you know. I really feel very sad. Uh, I am not well. I'm taking a class because I don't want you to lose out on anything. I don't know what I have might, if I do test positive, it might become severe, I don't know. But people don't come to class. It's, it's really, really sad. It's when I, I'm trying to explain things in detail. Usually what seem to be dense and opaque will become much, much clearer if we talk about these things in detail. Clarity lies in the detail. That's why I talk in detail. 
people find it boring people find it irrelevant people will pay some 2 lakhs and go and join some coaching institute which will say uh, this made easy that made easy and sometimes i wonder why do i even bother why don't i just come and just talk and go away why do i even bother anyway so my conscience doesn't agree for that and um, good good for you if you don't want you know what things are not my problem and very good for you if you succeed in life without uh, because i have realized you don't in uh, i have seen that uh, if you are sincere if you attempt to do things properly then you don't do well in life because what the what this country wants is mediocrity or less than mediocrity and well so for once i have to agree with what my friends say my friends say that you have wasted away by being where you are and you should have done something about your life sir does are attending regularly they are attending sorry those who are attending regularly they are attending classes yes yes they are i'm talking you you the size of your class is 45 see how many i have got seven hmm. seven people so that's okay i'm not like i said i'm not regretting i'm not regretting and i'm i just raised that because somebody was saying 14 people come to my class 18 people come to my class if you tell things in a simple manner and okay anyway forget it sorry about that rant um, uh, uh the, so when we are talking about the structural adjustment program first let us try and understand what is it that they wanted what are the components of the structural adjustment program the first component of this was to open up this was the first thing to open up your market no license raj none of those stuff the second thing that it advocated was to this was the second part to see already thanks to capitalism globalization had happened okay so we were already in a global economy 
But what we were trying to do was we were trying to prevent unfettered globalization uh, from coming to us. And the reason behind that was because we didn't want to, uh, you know, become dependent on others. Today, our prime minister talks about uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, and I, I have been tirelessly repeating it probably every time I meet you that this was a slogan of Nehru's and later on Mrs. Gandhi's. Uh, when I say Mrs. Gandhi, please remember, unless I spe specify it as uh, Sonia Gandhi, uh, it is always Indira Gandhi. Okay, when I say Mrs. Gandhi, the others I don't talk about. They are not worth talking about at all. Um, and I feel sad for that stupid man, uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi. He's not a bad sort, but he's a stupid sort. So that is his problem in life. Anyway, so uh, uh, then the idea was to improve production and productivity within the countries, uh, so what am I saying, sorry. Okay, so to also improve production and productivity, uh, See, production is, while you talk about improving production, you are only talking about uh, the production of a product, whatever that might be. Productivity is the growth rate that is attached to the production. Okay, that has a growth rate. So they wanted to improve productivity of industries. Uh, they had to grow uh, and they had to adopt newer technologies and not rely on uh, ancient technologies that were otherwise there in India. Now I'm talking only about India. And uh, so that is another thing that you have to remember. There is a difference between production. Production is uh, something that uh, is just saying that, okay, I produced 10 articles of something. Productivity is the contribution to the economy. Okay, how productive were you in terms of uh, contributing to the education system? This is what we are asked when we fill a self-appraisal form every year. We have to give an answer as to how productive we were. Okay, so when we, we are not a company that is producing students or anything. Productive was how much have you contributed to the growth of the education system there are some parameters uh, laid down for that. Uh, it's not just teaching. It also has to be publications uh, and it has to be how many books have you authored? How much have you contributed to the overall growth of education? So that is when they ask you how productive were you? Okay, so please remember that distinction. Uh, between uh, so this this again goes into what has now been what is now being called uh, academic uh, performance index. Okay, they they try to uh, basically see how much your 
productivity is. And fortunately for me, I have uh, put in quite a few of my publications on academia.edu. And for some reason, a lot of people are reading my articles there. So that gives me a, they calculate, okay, the, what is called the impact factor uh, of uh, the articles that I have put in there. And the impact factor that I have is pretty decent. I don't want to tell you any figures, it will be boasting. And uh, I have brought out books. And if I get through this crisis, I'm on the verge of bringing out another book. Uh, so if that also comes out, then I'll have to give the number of copies sold in India and abroad. And because that is, we get a quarterly statement from the publisher. And uh, so those again are to be added to the productivity. And so it is the API, the a academic uh, productivity index. Anyway, so that's the difference between production and productivity. Uh, then um, the next thing that we are uh, talking about is to what happened here? This is uh, the other thing that they laid down uh, to improve the competitive competitiveness of the economy and the industry in the international market or international sphere, if you want to call it that. And uh, please remember at that particular time that uh, we were not really competing with software that hadn't happened yet. I mean, software had come in, but uh, uh, th all thanks to Rajiv Gandhi, uh, who, like I said, was a man who had a vision, perhaps after Nehru, he was the next person with a vision. Unfortunately, he had a coterie of terrible really terrible people. Uh, so he launched the reforms process in 1985, but it was a half-hearted attempt. It didn't go forward. Uh, it should have gone forward, but it didn't go forward. He was badly advised. He was a complete neophyte as far as positive, uh, politics were concerned. And uh, he was simply driven by this idealism that I want to do this, I want to achieve this, which is a very good thing. He, uh, he could have achieved it, uh, provided he didn't hear, uh, uh, didn't listen to the advice of Vishwanath Pratap Singh, who was then in the Congress, uh, then Arjun Singh, yet another person. Vishwanath Pratap Singh, Arjun Singh are the two people who destroyed this country's education system. Uh, and uh, then um, Narayan Dat Tiwari, another nincompoop. Uh, so he too was there. So we had all these bad advisors. And uh, we also had, you know, people like Sam 
Petroda, who were giving the opposite kind of advice to the compared to the one that was being given by this coterie of uh, Vishwanath Pratap Singh, Arjun Singh, and uh, Narayan Tiwari, and there were some others. Okay, the Congress was full of them, and uh, uh, so you find that. Uh, this was one kind of retrograde advice and you had Sam Petroda and Captain Satish Sharma uh, who were people who were advising Rajiv Gandhi uh, to speed up his idealism and his, the, the, they were uh, way back in the 1980s uh, Sam Petroda was talking about cell phones now, that was sheer idiocy, given the fact that uh, we didn't have landline connectivity to all people on demand. We had to wait for years together to, to get a telephone connection at a time when your basic telecom sector is, has not taken off. You can't go and talk about cell phones and all that kind of thing. So, so there were these ultra modern and uh, out of touch with Indian reality people advising him on the one hand and on the other hand you had these uh, nincompoops, idiots uh, who were driven by vote bank politics uh, who were uh, advising him. And he made that fatal mistake of sending a peacekeeping force into Sri Lanka, which is what led to his assassination. Uh, so it was up to Narasimha Rao and uh, Manmohan Singh to steer the country. And like I keep telling you again and again, nobody even wanted to know if they had the majority in the house because what if they didn't have the majority? Then we'll have to take over and this country's economy is in complete shambles. Who would want to become uh, the prime minister or the finance minister or any minister uh, of a country that uh, just didn't have anything in it? Okay. So... So the basic thing, therefore, is that you're looking at uh, you're looking at uh, various um, factors that contributed to, despite Rajiv Gandhi being a visionary, uh, various factors that contributed to uh, his downfall and his killing. He lost the elections first, and then he died. Uh, and when uh, we see that uh, uh, the Congress came back, it came back with uh, P.V. Narasimha Rao, who people thought will be a silent fellow, will just sit. Narasimha Rao was made of uh, much harder stuff than that. And uh, uh, he proved that he was a very capable leader. He proved that he could identify the right kind of people to do the job for the country. And so he opened up the market and all these things happened. Uh, there is yet another thing that I have to talk about here, which is Sorry. I 
I guess this is like uh, closing the door after the horses have bolted my sanitizing my hands now. Anyway. The foreign reserves ran out because of balance of payments situation. We were importing too much and exporting very little. That was our economic condition. So how will you have? And we weren't allowing foreign investments coming into the bank, into the country. Okay, so the balance of payments situation was one of the problems of not being a competitive economy uh, in the international market. And a bit of it was also because of the fact that uh, we weren't integrated totally with it. Now, all these five points put together are called liberalization. So, liberalization <coughs> sorry liberalization is something that happened only um, it happened only uh, this full fledged integration, which is called the structural adjustment program. Okay, so this is what was suggested by the World Bank and the IMF. The question then is in an economy which doesn't have any money, okay, in an economy which does not have any money, how are you going to implement all these things? Okay, how are you going to implement all these things? So, the implementation Thank you. 
So that was the first thing to allow investment in the country in sectors that people chose to invest in. People meaning international players. So this basically came to be later on called the foreign institutional investors and foreign direct, direct investment. Uh, there is no difference between the two technically except that uh, I think up to $10 million, if there is uh, uh, an investment by uh, a mutual fund from abroad or something, uh, that possibly, uh, that possibly uh, will be uh, called an FII. Not possibly, it is. I'm not very sure of this ten million dollar uh, figure. Okay, uh, so please check that if you can. Uh, foreign direct investment is no limit. Now, even in insurance and all that, you have opened up seventy four percent. Uh, initially, when people opened things up, they said only 49%, then they went to 51%, and now it's 74 and 100%. In most sectors, it is 100%. Uh, we think that our banks are nationalized. They are, but not any more, because most banks have only 33% uh, investment of the government. The rest is all private investment. Uh, and uh, we've had too many banks, according to the BJP, and this is the result of their wonderful demonetization. So they've had to club banks together in order to consolidate resources of banks. Okay. Because if you have uh, one Andhra Bank, one uh, Union Bank of India, one, uh, they are, there were nine banks like that, uh, all right? And uh, if you have nine banks with uh, insufficient uh, funds for any kind of uh, developmental activity, it makes no sense. So therefore, they've clubbed nine banks together under the head of Union Bank of India. They have done that so that you can, all the money from all the these nine banks get pulled up. The same thing happened with the state banks because you had so many different, uh, apart from the State Bank of India, there, was, there were other state banks as well. There was a stat, the State Bank of Travancore, there was the State Bank of Hyderabad, there was the State Bank of uh, Rajasthan and Bikaner, and there was the State Bank of uh, Gwalior. All these banks, which were originally set up by uh, the rulers there, uh, they were under the State Bank of uh, India umbrella, but they had their distinct identities and it was decided that uh, why have so many banks? Uh, because so many banks would mean that uh, first you're distributing your uh, resources thinly and uh, uh, the other problem is that you'll have to have number of extra branches and extra employees. So cut all that down. What do you do? You merge them all together. So that happened. It, nine banks have come together under the umbrella of the Union Bank of India. And uh, uh, Bank of Baroda is uh, again a result of mergers the mergers is uh, of three banks, Bank of Baroda, Vijaya Bank, and the Dana Bank. So these banks came together and that's happened that there'll be further consolidation. This is not the end, there will be. Uh, 
So one has to wait and see. Probably we'll be left with uh, three or four banks uh, by the next five, 10 years. Uh, the rest will all be brought together and consolidated. And like I said, it's only 33% that they have uh, in these. Anyway, so this, they was to allow uh, foreign direct investment uh, in through buying of shares. How do you invest? One way of investing is by actually setting up an industry here, <clears throat> which is what the manufacturing sector is doing. The other way of doing it is buying up shares in the share market. Okay, so that's why uh, it was never very important uh, uh, for us to look at the uh, value of the share market index. Uh, and uh, in the early part of the 2000s, when UPA1 came into power and uh, it had 62 seats to the Communist parties all put together, that was seen as a bad sign. Uh, and the share market spooked. And in those days, uh, there was a big UN cry about uh, the share market shedding 400 points in a day. So that is a very big thing, 400 points shed in a day. Why? Because the overall index itself was worth some 4,000 points. Okay, just 4,000. So the Sensex dipped by 400 points. And then at that time, uh, uh, Chidambaram was the finance minister. And he had to tell people, no, don't worry. We, nothing will happen just because the communists are propping us up. Nothing will happen. So that is one of the things. OK, so but after that, just look at how the share market has grown, even despite the, uh, the pandemic and all that. It touched 50,000 points. That is, where is 4,000 points and where is 50,000 points? OK, and nowadays, even if uh, it crashes by 1,500 points in a day, People say it's okay. It'll probably recover in a few days, and it uh, normally does recover. So that's a completely new way of looking at things for us, which we otherwise didn't do. The performance of the share market, okay, and the gradual replacement of fixed deposits and all with mutual funds, so that uh, you know that can be all be put into the it can be put into the investment into shares. So see the growth of the mutual uh, funds, it's exponential and uh, quite bizarre for an old timer like me. Uh, so that is uh, one of the things. Then um, they said privatization. Let private parties invest. I said, the, what is the work of the government? The work of the government is to govern. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the work of the government is to govern. So let uh, the government um do its work which is run the country and not industries not industries so you see maruti suzuki the government withdrew completely it was maruti udyog uh, from which it has now withdrawn completely 
and uh, it has been trying to sell scooters in India. Nobody wants to buy that because it's not like Maruti Suzuki, which is making profits. Uh, but they have sold several other companies. And uh, apart from selling uh, companies, uh, they have uh, also um, allowed for private banks and multinational banks to come into India. Uh, we started having the credit card system, which was unheard of before. And so that kind of privatization uh, was something that was uh, uh, happening. So when we talk about liberalization, these are the things that we are talking about. Then uh, the next step that they said is um, increase exports. So traditionally, we've been uh, increasing exports in the form of raw material which is a very sad part. Uh, we export, we have a very big, uh, uh, what should I say, reserve of iron ore. So we export uh, the iron ore and uh, which is bad because that comes under raw material. You should not be exporting raw material. And then we had, uh, uh, the uh, clothes market, which was something that was our strength. So much to my chagrin, I have gone abroad and my friend said, I want to buy you a t-shirt. I want to buy you a t-shirt. And I bought a t-shirt he picked up and I said, you're giving me you pick it up and I didn't even open it, just took it and came. And after reaching India, I opened it and see it's made in India. So I bought a made in India t-shirt in Maryland, Gettysburg. So fabric exporting was something that we were doing. And uh, that was uh, encouraged and they said, uh, export more things. And computerization had uh, really taken up. So software development They began. But there is one question that remains unanswered. Is it just through a little bit of money that comes in uh, into the stock market or into the industrial sector where Ford will say, I'll set up a plant or Hyundai will say, I'll set up a plant or uh, SAIC will say, I'll set up a plant. How does that help us? How does that help us raise monies? The question, answer for that is that the beginning
that was how it actually started okay the start of uh, <clears throat> the start of liberalization was primarily making you give a an undertaking that we will go in for structural adjustments which is nothing but you know saying that i'm going to become a part of the uh, world economy and uh, i'm not going to retain anything to myself and say you can't come here you'll remove restrictions and all this was done through soft loans what is a soft loan a soft loan is one whose periodicity <coughs> sorry whose periodicity is long and as long as you are able to service it throughout uh it is also based on a much smaller percentage of interest the interest component is much much smaller in a soft loan okay so that is what the world bank and the imf were doing they were giving loans and on soft conditions if you are listening to us and if you let us monitor your economy then we'll keep giving you loans and uh, what will we do we will give these loans to you at much lower interest rates flexible payments and if you're good with your payments more loans that's how the credit card system works <clears throat> so they introduced the credit card system for the country so that's a credit system so they gave the country a credit line as it is technically called it was given a credit line and people uh, i mean the government was told uh, you start moving out of the sector sell sell all these things that you today uh, lic which is such a profit making company people said navaratna psus they will never send them sell them but they are now up for sale so you can see how it works so <clears throat> so everything is up for sale including lic and uh, they also sweeten the deal further by saying old loans that you have taken and you are finding a little bit difficult to service because of the higher uh, interest uh, rate attached to them we'll uh, reduce the interest rate there also so if you took a loan at uh, say something like 12% interest from the world bank or the imf an old loan then it was brought down to 6% or 6.5% so this is how once again liberalism took its birth now i what is laissez faire capitalism for cha cha i didn't even see it till now uh sorry about that i'll have to remove a bit of i mean not bit this whole thing will go uh now in india uh very funny thing happened at the time of uh, independence we had enclave development
enclave development is that there were certain parts of the country that were developed, like Mumbai, which was then called Bombay, was very developed. It is even today called the commercial capital, though I don't know why. Uh, uh, but there were only certain areas. Madras was developed. It was a littoral areas, the exception being Hyderabad, which developed under the Nizam and not under the British. <clears throat> now, what happened is that with the exception of Delhi, most of the other things were not in the northern part of the country. And since Calcutta was somehow caught up with that communist uh, party thing, uh, that city also didn't develop. But development, once liberalization happened, uh, the coastal Andhra people were immediately latching onto it as were the people from Karnataka and uh, from um, Tamil Nadu. So you see, this in the southern part of the country, There was a demand for proper federalism. Okay, the southern states started complaining that uh, we do all the thing and uh, you are investing that in the northern part of the country which does nothing. Okay, so therefore there was a demand for a proper federalism. And this coincided with <clears throat> uh, I don't think I can finish this now. <clears throat> okay, sir. Uh, because this I want to do properly. This is something that I really want to do properly. And however much I try, this is just getting extended and extended and extended. But uh, hopefully tomorrow, not hopefully, definitely tomorrow, we'll finish this off. We'll take this up. First, I have to explain what is enclave development. Uh, and then I'll have to explain uh, the demand of the southern states and Maharashtra and Gujarat. And so I can't rush it into the next few minutes, next couple of minutes. If you have any questions about what we have done so far, please feel free to ask. The rest I'll do tomorrow. Any questions about what we've done? Uh, sir, uh, what was the communist reaction to liberal liberalization? The, uh, the communist parties? Yes, sir. Uh, it was a reserved reaction. Because please uh, understand that even they knew that uh, 
the economy could not be sustained uh, anymore and uh, there are technically two proper communist parties and one which is something else which had uh, uh, the so the which are the proper communist parties the proper communist party was a communist party of india which was set up in 1925 and owed its allegiance to the ussr and uh, to uh, to yeah to the ussr uh, this was called the cpi or the communist party of india which wasn't very powerful uh, when the split took place the split took place in 1964 the split took place because of the fact that uh, Uh, i'm glad you asked this question because it will also help me explain some of the things tomorrow um uh, when the split took place the split took place on the grounds uh that china was achieving much more on its own so you now there is this uh, national uh, component and uh, the cpim was for reforms within the marxist framework within the marxist framework uh they supported uh, things like the signification of marxism that had been carried out by uh, by uh, mao zedong and uh, then they also was supportive of that idea of a new democracy i can talk about these tomorrow if you remind me and uh, so they were also looking at uh, some kind of adoption of a chinese model uh, of uh, communist development in india rather than the russian model uh, the more orthodox congress uh, communist party of india uh, basically said no that is not marxism what uh, mao uh, is doing in china is not marxism at all uh, so these people are more doctrinaire so to speak and so they opposed uh, them and therefore there was a split over the years the cpi just weak and even today the cpi probably has one or two seats in the whole country where they one or two constituencies i'm sorry where they win the rest of it whether it is kerala or bengal uh, you find that uh, it is a cpim so the cpim has always been a little bit of a pro reform uh, party i'm not talking about the ml groups which have now taken on the name maoist the the ml groups are called uh, cpi uh, communist party of india marxist leninist uh and they were the naxalites basically they it all originated in naxalbari and they have been on the fringes uh they are seen as anti social elements because they believed in violence but the, the mainstream communist parties the cpi had no option to shut up because the soviet union itself disappeared it couldn't what will it say when the country that it said we should follow that particular country is now 16 countries how will they even say we can't we don't want these reforms uh the cpim was guarded cautious and uh, they kept uh, telling uh, manmohan singh the, the finance minister 
that please don't make it neoliberal. They said you are uh, uh, a Keynesian economist and uh, that part of it should not be compromised. Uh, so they gave a conditional support, but who cares? But who cares? These are fringe parties. These are absolutely fringe parties. And as it, if, and they try to destabilize uh, the coalition uh, of UPA1. And what was the result? You had all the caste based parties. Uh, Samajwadi party, family based parties, Lalu Prasad Yadav's party, RJD, all these things, they said, we'll support you. Let the communists go. So they got sidelined anyway. They got sidelined and we had the rise of caste and family based politics. So that is what we can discuss tomorrow, if you like. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, then. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, Thank, sir. You, sir. Thank you. Take care, sir. Yeah. Thank you.